Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Nausicaas. This time it's Nausicaa Castle in the Sky? <laughs> no, sorry, I'll stop that. Let's not have this be a tradition. But, um, here I am, I'm back. Niat, you know me, you've seen me last episode. Also returning, Darkonius, probably needs no introduction, you remember him, Takahata Detractor, and so on. But we have three new people on board this time. Um, let's just go through all of you and you introduce yourselves. Miki, who are you? <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Mickey. Uh, I don't really believe in <laughs> Miyazaki at all, but somehow I got roped into this project. Well, we also need some differing opinions. And Tasu. Hello, I'm Tasu. I sometimes draw, and yeah, I'm gonna watch. The, I, I'm gonna watch all the Ghibli movies with the Ghibli cast. The Ghibli cast. The Nazi Nazi cast. cast. Yeah. No. Oops. You have, high quality, you have high quality podcasters here, not even knowing the name of the fucking podcast. <laughs> Do it with the Ghibli cast, then it will be a longer project, and you'll get more out of it. And we have Roggle. Hello, I'm Roggle. I, I like doing podcasts, they're fun, and I have a lot of opinions, so let's, let's, let's hear them. I'm interested in all of your opinions. So, Cast in the Sky, the first actual real Ghibli movie. Not, you know, we started with Nausicaa, Nausicaa being the precursor, the first kind of Ghibli movie, but now we have the actual Studio Ghibli founded and functioning. And what a, what a remarkable start it is, right? Already cementing all that we could expect from the aesthetics, from the style, from the fantastic landscape, from the children's adventure stories, all things we're going to see again and again. I mean, yeah, this movie... I mean, the studio was founded in 1985, and of course they were thinking, what will be our first project, what will be our mission statement? Because Studio Trigger did a similar thing in 2012 with Inferno Cop, which is quite a humorous mission statement, but it is very reflective of the studio in general, I think. And Ghibli did a similar thing with Castle in the Sky, where they put all their expectations of the studio in it. Great animation, always this very clean aesthetic that Miyazaki and Takahata had developed for 15 years now. Basically all the stuff you want from them, because that's the studio they wanted to have. They wanted a friendly studio, they wanted a studio that is also aimed at families, but also is a very can be a very adult studio, as you'll see with a movie like Grave of the Fireflies. And I think... Why Laputa doesn't quite go that deep, because this is just the first movie. They do have a lot of their hallmarks in this movie, and you can see that, especially in comparison with other Miyazaki works that he did earlier. Yeah, and you're mentioning something very interesting, the fact that uh, Miyazaki was interested in making films for children again. Actually, in, in, in not only in Starting Point, but also in Susan Napier's uh, Miyazaki world, there were repeatedly quotes of Miyazaki talking about how he really wants to make films to um, like inspire children. He wants to first and foremost make sh films that will be really worth something for children. And Cast in the Sky and Studio Ghibli in general kind of were the result of his desire to make such films because at Toei and stuff he was limited in the way in what, what he was allowed to make. He, is, he was repeatedly told that his style of his movies that he wanted to make for children weren't really asked for in that current time. So what did he do? He just made his own studio and said, fuck it, I'll just do my own thing. It <laughs> will be better this way. Yeah, after an odyssey of 10 years, that was like, yeah. I mean, when did he leave Toy? 1971? And then he founded Ghibli in 1985. Like he had a lot of time between that to mature, so the studio could become great from the start. And it really is great from the start. I mean, we see a ton of animation talent in here, and I think you have something to tell us about this. Oh yeah, this movie. You already already saw that in Nausicaa, because that's the thing Miyazaki always does. He has all the greatest animation talent, all his scenes, all his movies are based. Storyboards first, then animation, then story. That's how it always goes, and you see it in this movie with all the talent he has. Of course, we have Yoshinori Kanada again, which I mentioned in the last podcast, doing his famous Kanada dragon in this one. If you don't know the Kanada dragon, it's just a 
very special animation technique from the movie Genma Wars, which is much worse than anything Miyazaki has ever done, but it has this Kanada dragon, which is an amazing light effects dragon, basically, and in this movie it's all the, all the light, lightnings in the thunderstorm, but it's basically the same, which is, I mean, just look at it, it's mesmerizing to see what Kanada does. And also, I mean, every scene in this, where they are on the high up railroad tracks, yeah. where everything just falls apart, everything moves all the time, where they destroy entire, entire walls, entire walls of mountain, which just fall apart. Yeah, this Since... movie really does have quite a bit of joy in motion. You can feel it like every... There are so many action set pieces in this film which just, uh, like, enjoy, like, crazy camera angles, crazy cuts, where... You mentioned the, the, the scene on the, on the railroads, and it was really quite remarkable to see all this falling apart and every bits and pieces of wood flying everywhere, and it really, you notice a focus on, a, on exactly what you said, this developing storyboard kind of feeling. All the pieces of this film connect in a sort of motion. It is never just stiff transition, it is always motion, and it's really remarkable. And you can see also progress from Nausicaa, because if you remember the flying machines in, the, let's see, in Nausicaa, I don't know how to call it because I always use the name that sounds terrible to me. If you look at, those, mach if you look at those machines, they're basically flying manga cutouts. I already mentioned that in that podcast, but in this one, it's much less like that. All the, all the flying machines are one more detailed and more varied, I think. Especially the, what are they called? On the top, does I think? I called them one website I read up on them. My subs called them flap dust to small flying machines. Like those are insane to animate. And I mean, just look at them. Who would think of that? Also following the yeah. insect, the insects, of course. Yeah. The insect motif is still there. The, 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 the fluttering movement like a fly. But of course it goes further, like with Gol Goliath, Goliath, a giant airship. Especially that one memorable scene where it comes through the clouds and the pirate ship sees them where it comes up like a giant U-boat. And it's very great imagery there. The big enemy ship that is about to kill you, to destroy you. Of course it doesn't kill them, but it is very menacing in that shot. Also, the pirate ship is a very interesting thingy. I notice the same kind of uh, contrast here between the different flying machine designs again. Like in Nausicaa, we have this more nature-oriented flying machines that directly pull from the animal kingdom. In Nausicaa, we had the Mever, which is based on, like, seagulls. And uh, here we have, like, these insects contrasted with huge fucking... Uh, mechanical monstrosities that again like in Nausicaa push through the air push against it you you can really see how energy power coal whatever is needed to heap these giant lumps of metal into the air I mean they look like airships but made out of metal someone uh, looked at these and had a solution how they could fly it's lighter than air gas or basically Lighter and vacuum gas is, I think, the mathematically possible version. These things are so heavy they couldn't fly if they were filled with vacuum. But Miyazaki doesn't care. He'll build gigantic ships like that because that's what he wants. Yeah. And it is very in line with all the depictions of the human military. Because all of their buildings are like these giant metal constructions, rigid steel plates and all this stuff. Also their fortress, their gigantic fortress is like... I mean, I think the military in general reminds me of the German military of the 1910s, of the Imperial German Army. Because also they have Pickelhaube. For what reason? I don't know why, but they have Pickelhaube. Maybe Miyazaki liked the design. Also, the general is very militaristic in a German way. Yeah. It is just an observation, and their fortress, heavy stone. Only one thing can even destroy a fortress, apparently which is the robots that we'll talk about later, which also have amazing mm. cuts. 
where they where the one robot just destroys the fortress, just rips through it, towers falling apart. I mean, I can talk about this animation all day. All the people, they even have a prominent female animator of this movie, which might be notable. What's her name? Futaki Makiko, who also worked on on the Akira and most Ghibli movies. Like, I can give you the names of the animators and what they worked on, but the most important thing they've worked on will be a Ghibli movie, so... <laughs> what can yeah, I tell slightly. you? What's above a Ghibli movie in animation quality? Maybe Akira. Maybe. Yeah. Nothing else. Yeah, that is about the only thing I can think of. If you look at the people, Katsuya Kondo, Toshio Kawaguchi, Masaki Endo, they all worked on a lot of Ghibli films. They all made a lot of great things, a lot of great cuts. Every cut these people do is amazing, especially if they have the time which they get at Studio Ghibli and at no other studio. Yeah, they really focus on have, letting the animators have the time they need. And of course, everything the animators do is wrong and Miyazaki has to correct it. Because it's the only <laughs> guy who really knows how to animate it. Yeah, there you go, getting the most talented animators of the world and he's still the one <laughs> correcting every single cut. It's quite remarkable to go that far. But I mean, it shows. It shows. These movies really do look incredible. And especially in the animation department, reading about all his philosophies approaching animation in general, Miyazaki really has a vision in it. Like, if you read multiple pages of his musings on just walk cycles, you, you know the guy cares. He cares a lot. He cares a lot. It's amazing how much perfectionism is put into these films. They have all that talent just so they can even realize his, his ideas. And that's one of the things about Miyazaki that he really needs that. He's one of the directors who needs a lot of animation, full animation the most. He needs to be perfectionist because if he isn't perfectionist, his stuff falls apart. That's the thing. I think I think the one scene that really struck me with attention to detail is one scene that might just like go overlooked uh, amongst all the really impressive like scenes throughout the entire film. It is the one scene where they they, they arrive on Laputa and she uh, is trying to fix something on Pazu's person and in order for her to like do what she's trying to do with her hands she flicks her pigtail behind the back of her head and I thought that that was just such a, a, a detail that would go completely unnoticed by most people and it was not something that they needed to include but it was something that they 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 in order to portray this character with the realism that they wanted to portray this this little girl they they they, they made her do this action that would just create the sense of realism through her with wordlessly and without dialogue through this 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 action that she takes she becomes more realistic as a character who who does these sorts of actions rather than just someone who is only there for the particular scene and their only function within the scene is what is relevant to what is progressing yeah that's really a remarkable trend in most of his character animations that they always that he always focuses on the fact that they like i mentioned walking animations already but he's really concerned with the idea that no two walking animations should look the same. All characters should walk like their personality sh should accordingly be, right? And this shows in, in all the little interactions, like flicking the ponytail, uh, the, the, the pigtail and stuff. So, talking about attention to detail, what I find remarkable is again here uh, another kind of attention to detail, which is that in preparation for this movie, Miyazaki actually traveled to Wales together with Takahara, I think, and they went around and visited some uh, some coal miner, some coal mining facilities, and, and looked at them. And being shook by what he saw, he decided uh, then and there, as seeing these coal mining facilities, to base his uh, setting in this uh, in, in a in a coal mining village. So it's really interesting how he he took something he observed in reality and then tried to apply it to his very fantastical setting. And I mean, this, I guess this transitions us smoothly into setting, because what we have is a very interesting setting, because as you, as, you, as you can see, these coal mining villages are extremely vertical. They are suspended above abysses between, between mountains. In the mountainsides, there are all these coal miners and digging out the coal and stuff, and there's railroad bridges all across these uh, uh, fucking 
what's it called, cliffs to reach the other side, and everything's vertically spaced. So I think it was a really interesting and really cool uh, aesthetic expression of, of these kind of mountainous mining villages. I mean, this, these villages, yeah, now that you mention it, they look a lot like English and, by extension, mining towns from Wales. There's, there's very much that aesthetic. And what also struck me about the setting, there are all these buildings, but most of them are abandoned. Because I I don't actually know why, but a lot of the buildings I can tell it, you they're actually just it is, there. It is actually because when he was in Wales and saw these mining facilities, what struck him most was how abandoned they were, because many of them were left behind. There was at the time some sort of economic not crisis but collapse or whatever, and he saw all these like vacant mining facilities, kind of ghost towns even around. So that is what what led him to this expre- uh, impression. So the, this real sense of a well, that that he is still uh, remains his communist uh, uh, personality. It, this 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 main idealized village of the working class uh, uh, coal miners and all their struggles are only implicit, and and, and that's really interesting. This is this is how Miyazaki creates the setting. He shows you by uh, mise en scène. Everything is in the background, in the, in the characters. You can observe it from the outside. You see a very a village based on a lot of solidarity, because when Puzzle is running around in the village, the people care about him. They ask him, oh, who's that? What's about you? What's with the girl and stuff? They're all worried about him. They, they, they are completely ready to take care, f- care of him. And even the, the, uh, the, the train driver later on, who is uh, first supporting them, and then when the military is coming around, he's helping them out and... and, and you really get a sense of the the solidarity in this village as displayed in their behaviors, in their in their commonly shared lifestyle of like obvious economic struggles with some vacant buildings and so on. So again, we learn quite a lot about these people just by looking at their villages and how they interact with each other. So basically, the abandoned buildings in this movie are just anachronistic because Miyazaki didn't quite realize that those buildings in the time he said it would still be used. That's what I get. I mean... But I don't... <laughs> that's the way you could put it as I well. don't mind it because it gives this feeling that there has been a long history here and that this has been a way of life for ages now. And just like that, the, uh, the stories of the castle in the sky are also extremely old, so it fits into that, that everything in this... This world is lived in, has a long story, long history behind it. I, think. I mean, we, we could talk a little about the fact that, uh, at, as you said, at this time, the, the coal mines would still be used, the coal facilities. The thing is, he is doing a sort of anachronistic mixture here, same as in Nausicaa also, where you have these pastoral landscapes and landscapes and villages and uh, uh, civilizations that recall of of an older past of something more traditional more nature oriented more uh, well not technically more nature oriented but something of the past but then you also juxtapose it with like advanced technology that wouldn't exist here in this case in 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 laputa we clearly have to uh, have steampunk on our hands we have completely impossible technology for the time frame here and around and miyazaki actually commented on it it's himself because he said he wanted his setting to be in a time where technology was still fun. And this is very essential to, to a theme I'm going to talk about later, but just now, the setting, you can tell it, but it's based around technology that is fun to an extent. You have all these, these weird suspended railroad tracks, you have these huge lumbering flying machines, the funny little flying uh, uh, insect-like uh, flying machines. A lot of that stuff is really interesting and not as cold and calculated as reality or something. So Miyazaki really did put forth this vision of creating a fun steampunk setting and... and yeah, I agree. It. Nothing is I more think... fun than a giant robot destroying a fortress. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I, think I, I think a big part of that is uh, how haphazard and makeshift a lot of the technology is, that it feels home-brewed rather than something that, like, I guess, nowadays in, uh, in our society, a lot of the technology that we get is created by these big corporations and it's all perfect and sleek and like there's no there's no sense that it was created by a human it looks like it was created by a machine because it it was whereas the technology in Miyazaki's films and I love steampunk is very 
uh, home brewed. It's very uh, like it looks like someone like put their soul into it. They 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 made it and they they enjoyed making it and like this was their their livelihood. This was their passion and they 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 spent a lot of time working with these tools and making making things with by themselves and not relying on uh this 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 higher concept of these this this technology that's pre-made for them it's they make it themselves rather than have external forces make it for them which is also something we find reflected in Pazu's little workshop where he's working on stuff himself all these blueprints of little flying machines and wood stuff that he's working on and so on I don't uh I don't necessarily agree with that take. A lot of the stuff does sort of feel uh very early on like mass production uh sort of stuff. Not 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 quite modern, but but it does feel like um I don't know, very soon after after standardized parts were sort of invented very much sort of I mean, the military the stuff. The, well, not even the military stuff. I mean, you can even though there are I assume some sorts of personal touches on the uh the ornithopters that the pirates use. Yeah. Um they are very much sort of standardized. They're very much sort of the same vehicle, but they there there is a difference between them and those of the military flying machines. But it's very yeah. obviously uh more of there to represent that sort of harmony with nature that that Miyazaki so much focuses on. Well, uh, the mechanic of the ship spends a good time, good amount of time customizing and, and fixing the ship themselves. And I think that that's 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 part of it is is the whole uh, it's technology that you can fix yourself rather than technology that requires you to go to a specialist. I guess. Uh because this yeah, technology yeah. is it's it's things that you you tinker with by yourself it's yeah. in your home you 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 make things with it um but you 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 understand how it works there's also a very good characterization of these three different like social groups we have here we basically have the military and including Muska. we have the community which is existing on the fringe of like let's say larger society because military is the superstructure it is it is above all it is the dominant military uh, society dominating everything the community is still existing within this framework but it's kind of on the fringes you know they have their own solidarity their own ways their own ways of doing stuff their technologies maybe a mixture of the two i would say i would say they mostly repair stuff on their own have their own way of living and do their own stuff but then you have the pirate completely existing outside the system completely working on their own machines, doing their own stuff. And, well, technically we have the false kind of technology, kind of society, which is the Laputa technology, but there isn't really much of a civilization left, so those count in a kind of different category. But it's really interesting to see that there's these four different kinds of approaches to technology, which will also be important later on. Yeah, interesting about the pirates as well, while we're on it, is that the pirates start out as... A sort of neutral faction, even. We ha we are suggested that the pirates are like schemy, schemy, skeevy, like kind of evil people in the beginning. But it is, as it turns out, they have they kind of just their own moral code. They aren't bad guys in this movie at all. They are they turn out to be actually good. And what I see in them is this. I mean, it's it's a typical romanticization of pirates that we have in, in multiple occasions, be it Treasure Island or later on in history we had one piece and stuff where pirates represented freedom and not um any kind of like real pirate piracy which is cruel and horrible these pirates are also completely in that tradition they they are outside of society outside of the normal military patterns have their own way of doing things have their own machines have their own ethical code let's say and they do have ethical code and i like these pirates quite a lot because of it yeah, because because of the space they exist in, um, which isn't just on the fringes of society, but outside of it, they're they're very much a sort of uh, free society that's able to their uh, to create their own structure, um, and they do have their own structure, and their structure is is matriarchal as opposed to the sort of patriarchal militaristic dictatorship that we see in. Uh, whatever country Lapita takes place in. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think that's a good point to, to start talking about the characters. 
because especially in the matriarch that is Adola, I, I saw, I read quite some interesting things about it. And which is that um, uh, in the book uh, by Susan Napier, Miyazaki World, the, she talks extensively about uh, interviews with Miyazaki and his brother uh, and where they talked about Miyazaki's mother. And it, it seems to me that many um, family members of Miyazaki himself, as themselves have confirmed, yep, Dola is just the personality of Miyazaki's mother. She is loud, she's meddlesome, strong-willed, kind to others, strict about some other things, and just loud and flashy. That's the characterization Miyazaki gives of his own mother as well as Dola. So we can kind of see a parallel here. And as it turns out, Miyazaki's relationship to his mother was always one of conflict. And it's very interesting to read about this, of that his mother had like very divergent political opinions from him and they were always like in a spat talking about it, which is, if you think about it, not that typical of the, of the figure of the traditional Japanese woman in, in the household at all. But instead they had like these huge debates and these huge conflicts and were constantly in quarrel with each other. And I think it's really interesting in the way in which he reflects this on Dola. And uh, this really characterizes the whole uh, ragtag gang of pirates. This under this matriarch. It's quite funny because all the pirates call Dola Mama. Because does Miyazaki identify with all the pirates now? It's a, quite a funny, funny thought to me. That this is literally his mother, and all the characters are calling her Mama. Just something Miyazaki would do. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would make sense. I mean, uh, yeah. um, if I remember correctly, they were a household with a couple of boys, so <laughs> that fits quite well. Yeah, Dola also ends up acting like a sort of a proxy mother to Shita and uh, Pasu as they come on ship. Oh yeah, of course, that's that angle. Yeah, and like teaching them a bit of of what she of they what they have learned, so, so like discipline and getting new clothes, like a makeover shift, just to feel at home. Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting how she treats the children when when she assumes the position of of, of like a proxy or replacement mother, because she, on both of the children she at first like being like a tough um um being like a tough strong mother figure, first at first she projects ideas of their supposed roles on them. Right, this moment where she tells Pazu be a man or and you call yourself a man things along those lines and also another scene where she talks to uh, uh shita and says like aren't you a girl uh uh and 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 shita just answers so what so are you like she represents this first like moral instance saying saying all this stuff trying to raise them to be proper proper adults but then also fully embracing when the kids fully go against these expectations for example, the scene where Dola says, and you call yourself a man because Pazu was running away from, 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 from the prison where Shita was captured. And she's like, you gotta do it. And, and, and Pazu, instead of uh, taking this appeal to be a man uh, a, 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 as some sort of incentive to become a strong man or something in that moment, what he does is instead, I, he said, if I was clever and strong, I could do it. But please help me. So he mm. actively subverts the male boy hero figure and asks for help and doesn't even, even the matriarch figure who tells him to be a man doesn't really mean it in that way. When she hears that he's asking for help, of course she does it. She's, she's this strong-willed, maybe traditionally minded person, but she's completely open to adapt. And I think that's an interesting role. And it reminds me a lot of Miyazaki's stance himself because in all of his uh, stories, what we find is often traditionally female, traditionally male figures that in some way still manage to avoid their cliches. They are their right. stereotype gender roles. Yeah, that's quite a contrast to a very similar character in Conan from Future by Conan, who is basically a boy with superhuman strength who uh, nobody can uh, defeat in any way, who doesn't need to ask for help. He only asks for help from Lana, the Shita equivalent from that show, although they are a bit more different. Only asks for help in a very few situations and he doesn't need a lot of help from her, to be honest. Every time he asks for help, it's always this frame. He could do most of this himself, because in the first episode he just carries a great white shark. 
through the through his island after hunting it himself. He's ten years old. I mean, it's quite a contrast to this boy who is very clearly not the strongest boy in the world. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. In the fact that that Pazu act- absolutely has weaknesses, is, is able to admit weaknesses, and only finds the full strengths, I would argue, in joining together with Sheeta and like in their interactions with each other. And to even go further in this, and this, by the way, also tying into the general ideas Miyazaki has about children characters, I guess I should explain this first, because in Miyazaki World as well, I read an interesting uh, little uh, art about how Miyazaki sees children in his movies in general. The general idea is that um, children are seen as the voices of conscience. They uh, transform, because they are not like adults, they're, just to quote Mononoke a bit, because they are not, they can see with eyes unclouded, they directly put moral thought into action. They are inspiring in the way in which they are not like burdened by society, by like worries, by doubt, but instead take action. They are dynamic, they can become responsible individuals, and they frequently serve as moral guides for the adults that are in some way misled. They have a, like, in Miyazaki's depiction, childhood is always a space of innocent freedom, connection, of easily finding connections, of resonating with people, of immediately taking action, and in Miyazaki world it is actually tied into a very interesting memory that uh, uh, Miyazaki's, Miyazaki and his brother reflect on. Because back in, um, in when, I don't know, I, I, think, I think it was a, one of the bombings, uh, one of the fire bombings hit Miyazaki's city when he was a kid, and his entire family had to hop on a truck and escape from the city. And a memory that Miyazaki still remembers, despite only being four or five years old from that event, is that he was looking out the back of this truck and he saw a, a mother carrying a child in her arms, asking to be taken with them. And Miyazaki, as a kid, didn't speak up, but he knew he wanted to speak up. And it's st- one of the strongest memories to which he recounts is that he, he, he knows he should have spoken up. He, he knew that on the truck there wasn't any space anymore to, to let this mother with a child on. But for him, as a child, he knows he should have spoken up. He should have told his, his parents to figure something out. This is basically what he channels in these child characters who can serve as guides. Just an interesting side note to this anecdote, uh, his brother Arata remembers it differently and says that Miyazaki basically uh, imagined his mother and child, but this is another story. This is basically uh, (laughs) a little contradictory uh, little memory of Miyazaki, which is very indicative of his thought process anyways. Yeah, all his main characters have this superhuman kindness in them. This is a very common thing. Also, Kono. He also has that superhuman kindness, of course. I think that that's one of his classic wish fulfillment things, which he wants all his child characters to have. I mean, he also wants to inspire real children to become like this. This is this ties into the fact that he wants to make films for children. And what he shows is, I mean, he often has orphans or kids in a situation without parents as their as, as his protagonists. And this is in order for the kids to make them fend for themselves which they do and they find along the way maybe replacement parents or like parent figures like Dola but ultimately they're on their own they need to own, make their own moral decisions and that's that's very indicative of this film I you know another character which I want to compare here because I will compare a lot to Future by Conan because they are very similar stories is Muska the main antagonist because for one, the main antagonist in the Conan is literally called Lepka. You might see the similarities here. And also Gendo from Evangelion is interesting in this discussion. First, Lepka and Muska, because Muska is not the most complicated, most complicated antagonist. He works with the military under the guise that he will help everyone because the country thinks getting to a Laputa will be good for them, it will help their situation and everything. While uh, Muska really just wants the castle for himself and rule the world with it. Lepka has a similar thing with his country industrial, where he basically just uses all the people in the country, all the scientists, and turns into an evil dictator by the end of the story. But the problem is, 
Lepka also has a giant weapon at the end, which is his flying machine Giganto, but his plan doesn't make any, any sense, while Muska's plan does make sense. So I think Miyazaki, Miyazaki took that idea of Lepka, who is the evil antagonist who will try to rule the world, and refine it to a character that actually works, because with Lepka, he has an airplane, which will run out of fuel and which can do nothing for him, while Muska has a giant flying castle, which is powered by magic and has lots of robots, which will fight for him. So his plan, it's still stupid, because alone you can't rule the world, but it's better than Lepka. And also for Gendo, if you look at Muska as a person, he acts very similar. He looks very similar also because the small glasses, he's not the main guy in charge. The generals are actually in charge, but at some point he takes over. See Ava episode 1, and he has his own schemes behind everything. I think Anno once again took a lot of inspiration from Miyazaki, as he did with other works like Nausicaa and everything. Like, I talked a lot more about it with that movie because it was more important there, but it is also a very clear point of comparison, I think. Where well, basically, he liked Muska, so he made a similar character. I mean, I think, I think one of the interesting things to me about Muska is that he very much has sort of a... Mm, I don't know how to say this, but he has a very simplistic, childish view of the world. Um, in the sense that he's sort of been filled, uh, with this sort of myth, um, this legend of Laputa and that his, his family has this uh, connection to it in the past. And so he thinks that he alone is the one that is, is, is worthy of controlling this larger world in a very, very simplistic childish sense yeah which is also a thing in lepka who thinks he can just rule the world once he has his weapon which obviously won't work and in gandor who thinks he is the one who can do it when it's actually clear that he won't be the one to rule the world that it's his son and that he looked at it far yeah, too simply yeah there's no sort of i think follow-up plan from from muska there's no sort of end goal it's just i'm gonna get the power of lapida and I'm going to use this to, to, to what? <laughs> to reshape the world to his liking? Uh, I mean, his, his end goal is just power, I think. Yeah, his end goal is sitting in a castle alone with a bunch of robots and animals. That's all he has. That's all his castle is good for. Everyone he gets on his side after obtaining the castle will just want to kill him. It is obvious. Can't rule the world. If you get your allies after you have the power, I don't. I don't even think that that he particularly. I mean, I. I think there's a lot of of, I guess, coding in this film about, um, as it often is in Miyazaki works, of this sort of um, connection between uh, sort of living a harmonious life with nature and uh, using. Uh, particularly in technology, being harmonious with nature, and instead using that technology for military might, for the acquisition of power for its own sake. Um, and we can definitely see that in the, the first robot we see on Laputa, where, where before we were conditioned to think of these things as these ultimate uh, military machines. Uh, very powerful, very strong, and and when we arrive on Lapida, and the first thing we see is this robot that's concerned about protecting a bird's nest, and nothing more, right? So like he very much codes these things as as sinister or evil in the one case, and and very much beneficial uh, to be lauded in the other. Once again, this is an evolution of a female Conan, where. In the Laputa, you have the castle in the sky, and in Conan, you have the the country, industria, and solar power. Where basically, in Conan, once they obtain the solar power, which is the big plot point, which Lepka wants to obtain, and which they only get after Lepka is thrown out of the country, where they basically use it for a lot of good things and then just leave it to be destroyed without any good reason. 
while in Laputa they don't have any other choice but to abandon Laputa and they don't destroy it. More importantly, because the castle lives on with all its wonders. Well, most of its wonders, half of them fell into the sea at the end, but basically the castle lives on and maybe a more peaceful generation of humans can uh, go there again if they want to, while in a future by Conan. The satellite that provides him with solar power is still there, but every all the technology that made it possible to access that power and all the scientists that made it possible die, all destroyed. I read an interesting quote from Miyazaki about Laputa. Uh, it was from an interview that he did in 2011, so he's had quite a long time to reflect on his career at this point. Um, and, and this is what he had to say about it. I wanted to make an adventure story with the kind of boy hero who starts out fighting and has a lot of dreams. And I was able to confirm that people don't come to see that kind of film. After a time, a lot of people started saying, I love Laputa, but at the theatrical release, it didn't attract much of an audience. A male is recognized as an adult when he has a job, an occupation. For a woman, her physical presence itself makes her a character, but a man needs to have this social occupation or some kind of status or some kind of fate, something you can't see. So with a labor child like Pazu, it was very hard to draw the audi audience to the cinema. I wish I could make another film with an 8 or 9 year old boy hero. Boys, they often end up with a tragic existence in this world. It's a very hard, tough place for boys to live now. So that's, that was Miyazaki talking about Laputa in this interview. And uh, I think that's a really interesting way for him to describe his, his filmography. Because... Uh, most of his main leads are girls, and this is kind of the outlier within his filmography for having a young boy as the male I lead. I mean, he has two stories like that, one of them the evolution of the other with Conan and Laputa, and all the other yeah. male main characters, like Poco Rosso, is already a fighter pilot. But specifically yeah. a young boy. The, the, obviously it was an evolution of Conan, but uh, in terms of his filmography, uh, this is the only one. Yeah, the comparison is... with Porco Rosso being a fighter pilot. He's already a middle-aged man. Ashitaka is a, is a young adult already. Next boy, I mean, in Ponyo, what's his name? Uh, Sosuke? That's a young boy, but it's also a much younger boy, and he doesn't have these hardships. It's another completely different story. Yeah, I think Pazu is, is the one... I shouldn't be making these statements. I've seen like five Miyazaki, but he's the one male character I've seen in a Miyazaki film who isn't already self-determined, who doesn't already have, uh, who hasn't already settled into who he is as a person, who hasn't settled into a role. Um. Yeah. Um. So uh, about the the hasn't really settled in, hasn't really gotten his role. What, what I think is remarkable is how our parallel protagonist, a, a typical Miyazaki girl in, in, in Shita, is really a good match for, for, for Pazu. From this movie, I didn't get the impression there's any imbalance between them. There's, it's not like Pazu is protecting Shita, or uh, that even Shita is in need of protection per se. I mean, yeah, there are scenes where he's running to... to, to save her in the sense, and he's saving her in the sense that he's getting the pirates on his side, and so on. But we see Sheeta is extremely crafty, she can do this stuff on her own. We The first scene we saw was her escaping from a kidnapper, kidnappers with her own strength, and she even, like, fell down from the, the entire airplane and was saved by her crystal stone, and... So what we can see is that she is strong, and at no point does she need in her strength to succumb to, to, to Pazu's strength or anything. Because this is interesting, uh, and often in those boys' adventure narratives, there is a point where the boy needs to rise to the challenge and needs to rise to protect the girl. But he really, in a sense he does, but in a sense he also doesn't, because Cheetah at no point is really weaker than him. And even when uh, Dola is there trying to put her in her role, I mean, I see kind of subversion in there. It, she does trying to put her in this role, but she she just says, yeah, uh, like Dola says, 
because you're a girl, and Cheetah just answers, so what? So are you. And Dola just smiles knowingly, because, yeah, Cheetah has proven that she can go beyond being just a girl. And in this yeah. way, she's... And this is, again, a Miyazaki thing, but she still can be a girl. We see it. She is wanting to work on the ship, not necessarily because she, she, she like, enjoys cleaning or cooking or whatever for the, for the pirate, but instead, she wants to be useful. She also wants to help out. And I think that's a really good way of, of framing it. The way in which Miyazaki allows girls to be feminine without making them weak women or anything like. He, he doesn't fall into these trappings. Yeah, to the, to the contrary of this traditional power dynamic, the first person who saves the other is Shida saving, uh, saving Pazu. Pazu. Yeah. When, when she agrees to go with the military at the beginning because because otherwise otherwise he's he's dead he's he's done right and pazu gets as far as he does because he borrows his feminine power from the pirates um otherwise the the story pretty much ends at the at, before yeah. it even begins right yeah. so yeah. so very very consciously miyazaki uh, subverts this very traditional gender dynamic uh, in these sorts of adventure stories where the the yeah. male main character is the one that has to go out of his way to save uh, the feminine. Um, instead, he just Emo. turns it the Let's other way. Let's not forget that Puzzle would be dead if um, it wasn't for the crystal on the railroad, where they fell off the, off the destroyed railroad track into the cave. Like, uh, and another interesting thing about this is um, in an Traditionally, these, these narratives end with the empowerment of the boy, and as yeah. a reward, basically, at the end of the story, he gets to marry the girl. That was, that was what I was going to try and get into. Yeah. Uh, and, even, and even better, Miyazaki in an interview said he got mad at an interviewer who, who said that he wanted them to kiss, and Miyazaki was, no, <laughs> then it would have been a different kind of relationship, not the kind I wanted, basically. He was getting mad at him because he insinuated this kind of traditional married structure at the end of the quest exactly. story. And I think that's really remarkable to see how he consciously just goes past all of these traditions and traditional ideas. Yeah, because um, traditionally, the the dazzle and distress trope is 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 used, and and it could have been used, but it wasn't in this case. It is generally used as a tool to make the man grow with respect to the woman as a tool for that growth. But the way it's used here, it's not used in a way that makes Pazu grow it is a, a way that's like well it, it, it's used in a way to make him grow but it's not treating Laputa as a tool in that exchange of power uh, instead it is because normally within these tropes the, the villain is using the damsel as like a target for the hero's weakness in the sense that in order to overcome that weakness, they need to either prove themselves as a man and re re recover that weakness or uh, dispense with the weakness uh, in some darker versions of that tale. Uh, but in reality, the, the villains don't... It, within, within the context of this film, the villains don't care about Pazo. He's not even factored into their plans. Uh, Laputa is the reason that they are being so uh they're the reason that they're the reason that they're coming after her is because of her significance and importance and her power so she is the one who is like being driven by the plot rather than pazu himself and pazu is almost a bystander for a lot of the film because he is completely powerless to change anything uh relative to the the people who are driving the plot forward with their actions that being Laputa and uh just replace Sheeta every time you said it. Yeah. In that part. Yeah. <laughs> her name is Laputa. Well, her last name is Laputa, that's true. And yeah, it's no mistake at the end of the film that the 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 key uh thematic I mean the the shot that we focus on is is Laputa ascending far above the earth, right? Uh Pazu is just sort of an accessory to what happens. He does play an instrumental role in helping uh, Sheeta get to where she belongs. But but at the end of the film, what we focus on 
is this image of of Lapita, this this sort of uh, utopia ascending outside of human reach. And just to quickly, this is a great point to go over into the greater thematic things. But just to 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 put a cap on the whole masculinity and femininity idea we talked about. I think it's interesting here to talk about the absent father of, of Pazu, which is, as we could see in the early scenes, it was basically his ideal to rise up to. to he had his, had his father's memory, this, this, this idea that his father saw Laputa once and was always chasing it. And he was obsessed also with flying machines, with the idea of what his father was finding there. This is basically the impetus why he is interested in going on this quest in the first place, why he's interested in her as well, making this connection to his father basically the ambition the the his glory glorious hero father who who was seeking laputa and having this huge adventure in the past and he even sees the face of his father when he is in this in this thunderstorm which is around laputa when when they reach it and just to uh, remark on the way in which this relationship to his absent father is transformed i think by the end in abandoning Laputa, which we're gonna get into more shortly, he also abandons the heroic, heroic figure of his father. He can close that chapter in his life. He has something to, he has found something to move past this idea of his father that he was aspiring to, that he was trying to reach. I mean, in a sense, he also completed his quest and realized how dangerous this was uh, in, in the fact that Laputa itself is such a dangerous thing. But he also closed that chapter of his life and came out basically with his own idea of who to be. Not just a copy of his father anymore, but his own guy. Okay, so then what is Laputa? What does Laputa mean? What is this huge flying island with this imposing weapon of mass destruction? Now I got something very interesting here. Because in researching I found a, a cool little essay. It's called... a. Uh, it's called The City Ascents, Laputa Cast in the Sky as Critical Ecotopia by Anthony Leoy. And this essay really makes some interesting parallels. The first I want to point out is in the evident parallel between the island, the Cast in the Sky, the flying island of Laputa, and the Tower of Babel. The parallel is, of course, not only visually in this weird tower structure, which is very reminiscent of this tower, but also this idea of grasping so high that you lead yourself to destruction. In, in, in the Tower of Babel, there was this division between top and bottom. At the top, you had the people always saying, build higher, build higher, build higher. And at the bottom, you had the people actually working on it. And they ensured that there's no common language between the people to communicate. So what you had was an arrogant elite on the top being disconnected from the bottom, which is very mirrored in, in, in the flying castle in the sky, actually, because it is also divorced from the bottom. They, they themselves, the Laputa civilization, had to realize that you can't live detached from the Earth. And I found, uh, just quickly to tie it into another aesthetic element, I found it very interesting how that is mirrored in the moment when they're exploring the cave and the old man is in there and is showing them that even underground there's a sky. So we have this theme, this duality between even underground there's a sky and the castle in the sky of people living detached from the earth. So Miyazaki is already taking a little stance here. He's, he's, he's drawing these parallels, saying this is this elite technology, this, this separation from the earth. The earth itself is not something we must leave. We need to leave in this way. Flying is freedom, of course. It's, it's always his motif that flying is to some extent freedom. But you can't always fly. You can't live separated from this earth. And... Uh, this, this essay goes further. This is just the initial symbol, basically, it's built, it builds on. And I think it, it, it highlights something very interesting, and that is also given the title that it is a critical ecotopia. So let's get into the terms here. First of all, what is a critical utopia? That's a genre. And the critical utopia is characterized by three criteria. First, it must contain an overtly dystopian element, that makes an implicit critique in utopian, in utopian discourse explicit. Two, it demonstrates an awareness of past utopias. And three, it forms a critical mass of popular readers to implement its critique in society. And augmented, we have this instead of an utopia as an ecotopia. So let me explain all these things and how they tie to Laputa. 
First of all, Laputa obviously exemplifies all the critical utopian elements in environmentalist terms. We have the beautiful other worlds, and we have the, the, the counterexample of the city of war, which also embodies some sort of utopian element because it is an elite society, a high society, something with extremely high technology. So Laputa embodies the contradictory nature uh, of, of living of an utopian project. You have a utopian project which tries to build a real-life utopia, but you also have a destruction that it inherently causes, a rift, uh, 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 a cut. So we have this dystopian element present which criticizes the very idea of achieving this flying castle utopia. The second demonstrates awareness of past utopias. Laputa is a reference to, to Jonathan Swift's Laputa, uh, which is also just... As a side note, La Puta in Spanish, the whore. Well, there we have another Babel, Tower of Babel <laughs> comparison. And in, in, in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, La Puta serves as a function to... Um, in Gulliver's Travel, it is uh, uh, like a parody of uh, uh, scientists, of scientist arrogance, which are flying around looking down on people that... Um, are so divorced from the people below, so absurdly distant from them that they cannot understand them at all anymore. And Miyazaki shares this sentiment in a sense, but twists it in Laputa in a little bit of a different direction. Miyazaki um, sees a sort of, embodies a sort of hope in Laputa as well, because of something very interesting that I'm going to get into shortly. But uh, just the third point, it forms a critical mass of popular readers to implement its critique in society. I think that goes without talking that Miyazaki movies have a huge audience, that they reach people, that they can tell people, that there's a conscious audience here which is, rece which is receptible of its seems. So, what I mean by the element of hope that Laputa inherently contains, and this is very interesting, if robots and nature Technology and nature on Laputa live in harmony. This is a very... And I didn't think about this first. This, this essay really pointed me in an interesting direction. In the absence of humans, technology and nature can live in harmony. This is really different from what we often get. Often we get these depictions of technology as that which corrupts nature. Here, we have a very clear distinction. The robot can care about the bird. The robots are gardeners. The robots are not evil and are not destructive if it's not, because, if it's not for humans. They are absent. Without humans, this utopia is real. And this is interesting because it tells us, no, technology is not evil. Only the way in which humans interact with technology can cause this destruction. And what I like specifically about this is Miyazaki often comes off as someone with such a huge anti-technological sentiment of na natural communities, of synergistic wind machines and all this stuff. His relationships to his communities is often a pastoral one, of living closer to nature, of agriculture and stuff. But he is very evident. No, technology is not the problem. We are. Yeah, I think, I think he's very... I, I... I mean, I think it's a misinterpretation to think that that um, Miyazaki takes a very Luddite stance of anti-technology, of, of pro-pastoral uh, nature. I mean, I think what he's highly critical of behind these things is human intent, is the, the way that humans control technology to enforce power, to enforce control, to to use this overwhelming power that, that as a side effect will poison the earth. Um, to their own intent. I, I think he sees in a lot of cases that, that human technology can be harmonious with nature, in fact. And we see this in the ornithopters that the pirates use here. We see this with the, the gliders and Nausicaa. Um, it's, it's all over his works that humanity can, in fact, and, and with the, the robots here who act as gardeners of Laputa, um, He's very much aware of the fact that outside of these very human uh, desires for domination and control, that technology is not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily this poisonous, 
controlling force. This also ties back into the uh, quote I mentioned earlier, that the story is set in an era where machines are still exciting and enjoyable, and science does not necessarily make people unhappy. This is something he is trying to make us aware of. He's contrasting this. He's contrasting this with a science that is making people unhappy versus machines that once could have and were fun, back when our relationship with machines hasn't become so tied up yet, hasn't become so problematic yet. And it, it, it's really, it's really, it's really, it's really cool. Also, the robot's relationship to nature, just a really interesting little detail that um, the little fox from Nausicaa reappears and it, it is, is a friend of the robot, basically. And what the movie is telling us in a sort of metatextual awareness is, look, a friend of Nausicaa is a friend of nature. This robot is a friend of nature. <laughs> and this is really just a nice detail. The, the robot represents a sort of restored relationship of technology to nature when, when, the, when human war and destruction has, has been overcome, when it's, when it's absent. The, this, this picture is at the same time like sort of sublime and depressing because in this picture, in this embodiment of the robot caring about nature, we can really see our own failures as, as humanity in the way in which it, this is not reality, in the way in which this is a surprising image to us. And I think that makes it, that makes it aesthetically incredibly powerful. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I think something that I neglected to point out um, is, is not only just that this technology exists harmoniously outside of human intent, but also the sort of unintended consequences that we see of this human intent where, uh, say... Pazu and Shida's glider laid on top of this bird's nest, um, are, which is something that that I think generally we wouldn't too much think about or too much notice without the um, insertion of this robot moving that same glider. The focus put on that um, is, is something that we need to think about. Is something that we need to consider. Is that our the unintended consequences of a lot of modern day human technology is something that has these very detrimental effects on the modern world and that we have to be more considerate of this sort of a, a correctional factor that Miyazaki inserts in this one moment. And also very interesting about this whole dynamic is when they cast the spell of destruction on the, on the city to prevent the use of the weapon and stuff. Not the entire island is destroyed, but instead just the weaponized part at the bottom of it and the rest of the island carried by tree roots that expand into the sky at that moment. It still exists. It shows that the weapon is not at the heart of the city, but instead without this harmful weaponized identity, this can still exist. It is still, it is a very interesting figure in that it is an ut a utopian situation that is at the horizon. At the end, the characters need to leave because they realize humanity is not yet in a position to make use, to be able to utilize this kind of technology. But it is at the horizon. At some point, maybe humans can reach this utopian home that is floating there. When we have gotten past our issues, when we have gotten past our shit, it is still floating there and it is showing us that we can have something like this. It is not a purely utopian ending because humans are not able to stay there. But we have still the option open to at some point reach this. The ending is asking whether humanity even deserves to be part of the world. Like, humankind is often in exile from a potentially utopian tone, which is a quote from the, from the uh, essay. And I, and I found this figure of the humankind is orphans really interesting because it mirrors how the kids both are orphans. Pazo and Sheeta both are orphans. And this, this is really interesting, that we are orphaned from our utopian future by the fact that we ourselves have first to grow up to take responsibility to be able to reach it. You know, this is a really interesting parallel, and I can't really make sense of it, because in Future by Conan they give up utopian power with solar power. But in that series I don't really understand why, why they destroy all the access to the solar powered satellite which would obviously be a good way to live in harmony with technology and nature 
you have the energy come from a place that is completely disconnected from nature. Now you can also say that the castle in the sky is completely disconnected from nature and from the earth, but I really don't see how it works in that show. Maybe it's another evolution of that the another theme of evolution between these two works that now the castle in the sky that exists that continues to exist it had to be abandoned at that point, so our power didn't have to be abandoned in Conan, and that we can reach it again. I don't. I don't necessarily think that Laputa is depicted as as disconnected from nature here. As a matter of fact, I think what we see uh, when the bottom falls away, when the weapon is destroyed, is removed, is that the connecting tissue of the technology of Laputa is the tree roots. It is nature, right? So. Yeah, I mean, so I from think the, the thing earth, is that I mean, it's its own that little it's more nature. Of, That's the difference here. Uh, it's disconnected yeah, from the it, earth, but it's, it's its own nature now. Yeah, I think the thing is that that humanity is not ready to to seek that sort of connection between technology and nature. That's sort of implied here. Um, that we're not ready to to unite these two sort of, I guess, forces that we normally think of as in opposition. And that we're not ready to accept the inherent connection that Miyazaki sees between them, um, where technology is, or can be, in fact, very much harmonious with this natural setting, where nature can become this connective binding tissue between uh, technology and humanity. Um, and that there is possibly a future where they can be connected um but i think it's more of a matter that humanity just isn't ready for it yet this goes neatly into the the next out of large thematical body that i have prepared here and it is a, a very interesting thing where in 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 Susan Napier's Miyazaki world again, in, in context of Laputa, she talked about Miyazaki's politics of mourning, uh, in which she characterizes as neither passive nor resigned, but activist concentrating on what remains rather than what is lost. And here it is clear, Laputa is lost, but the focus is not on Laputa. They have abandoned it consciously. They, they, they knew they couldn't connect with it yet. They focus on what is what remains. They go back to human society, they uh, rejoin with the pirates, and they will go into the future, maybe aspiring to recreate something, but they're very grounded. And this is here related to the idea, of course, mourning in a sense, something is lost, right? Laputa's lost, Utopia is lost in this moment, probably for the lifetime of the kids, who knows? Loss motivates in this sense, lost Utopia in this sense. Laputa is a Utopia that is lost. The, the kids have seen it fade away, fly away into the air. The fusion of technosphere and biosphere is a lost utopia at this moment. But what, may, what remains? We people remain. And this is the message this film is about, I think. The inspiration, the action that is inspired when we confront this lost of utopia. The community that has to deal with the absence of utopia. And Napier really uh, neatly ties this into something of Miyazaki's real-life experiences where during his growing up, and you can also see this in Takahata's work especially, that the green world around them has been gradually demolished by bulldozers, skyscrapers, urban developments, etc. No longer connected to the, the, the past. post war Japan has really created a sense of, and I quote here, spiritual orphanhood of the people exiled from their own history. And this is very similar to the sense of the castle that has floated away. The sort of nature that has this, the, the nature, technosphere, utopia that is floating away. We, we get this in all of Miyazaki's relationships with nature in his films. And Takahara especially, just look at Pompoku, you can see this exact process of, demol uh, of demolishing of nature by bulldozers and skyscrapers and cities right there. And what this really highlights is how the floating castle, the one utopian state we cannot reach it it's just out of grasp and it is doomed to fly away it's really mono no avara again like in nausicaa i think one one of the things that struck me when i was watching it is i felt like if 
with this connection to Miyazaki, I felt like it, it's interesting to see what he didn't do because the ending of the film could have ended with uh, the this beautiful castle being destroyed uh, and just with uh, with the the technology that keeps it up being uh, removed, the castle itself could have come down, but instead it survives. And I think Miyazaki couldn't bring himself to destroy something that beautiful because like to him, it was a symbol, uh, like something to aspire towards. And I, I think that there is a lot of to say about uh, Laputa as a symbol and how symbols can be used and corrupted and misused in like uh, as a as a political tool so as in itself laputa is beautiful and like very few people would disagree with that but it also means a lot of different things to a lot of different people within the world of uh, laputa so in this sense it can be used for this 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 purpose of looking back uh, with an idealization of these people who are ab who are above everything and say look at what they did we should uh, aspire to be them aspire to be these 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 people these giants and and exercise this power that they have left us to to uh, dominate all of those around us but there and there are other people who look at Laputa and just see uh, a beautiful relic, something to be uh, memorialized and uh, like res restored and repaired, or just just something to be to be looked at from a distance rather than something that you can engage with. Uh, and it's interesting to see this this machinery. Uh, I I feel like the machinery itself on Laputa is part of this physical representation of the corruption of this symbol that has occurred with this this beautiful uh relic uh being used for something that is so evil and and horrible and destructive uh that Miyazaki felt like he needed to purge the symbol of the corruptive essence that was uh turning it into this weapon and and but it's it's also showing his conflict about it because he he understands that even still like laputa still will be the symbol to to all these people and that's not going to change but uh by removing and pacifying it and and keeping it out of of reach of of humans he's creating this barrier that stops it from being used as a tool for domination uh between the the people who are up in the clouds and the people who are down on the ground. So I think in that sense, it's very political. Yeah, you're leading me to a very great uh, 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 idea here. And that's probably everything you were getting at. This is also a critique of modernity, in a sense. It, like the all, all the 20th century project, modernity is basically characterized by all these gigantic political projects, be it national socialists who did all their stuff to reach the glorious homeland, or be it communism, which claimed to reach the perfect utopian communist final state. But what is always on the flip side of these 20th century projects of modernity was that they were enforced by cruelty, by brutality, by weapons. This is the same thing we have in Laputa here. And we see the same yearning for Laputa in many different ways. You have uh, opportunists who want to use the weapon who who mis who Masca clearly was on 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 the idea of yeah let's find Laputa, and he was always thinking about yeah I want to use the weapons. He was taking the utopian ideal, the strife, the modernist project, and was turning it around to use it as a weapon. Miyazaki shows and displays in this sense of loss in this distant utopia of which we need to let go for now. I think it is already prefiguring some of his developments away from, from this the more simple communism he had in the 70s back to a, a more reflected, more aware, more ideologically skeptical Miyazaki that we find later in his works and which he commented on himself extensively in that he recognizes this duality of the weapon that is always attached to the utopian project or at least in that figuration. But 
here's the remarkable thing. He does not give up on the Utopia. This has just gotten a new layer. He does not give up on the Utopian project, despite the weapon being attached to it. He just says, we people need to figure out a way first to get rid of the weapon. But getting rid of the weapon is not easy. Because even if you destroy the weapon there, it, it, just to lead into a thought, <coughs> sorry, um, the book The Anime Machine by Thomas Lamar, which I also read on this, which writes extensively also about animation techniques used in Laputa, and it juxtaposes it with a lot of things like, for example, how the flying and the movement of kids is, is displayed as very open and stuff in, in a way that relates differently to technology than Muska in his very deterministic and technologically minded stance of utilizing this opportunism, this very strong and, and a stoic approach. But uh, I, I, all these details were a bit uh, overwhelming. You should really, audience, you should really read this book. It's a really interesting book. It really goes into a lot of deep uh, analysis of animation itself, of the frames, of, of the way with which the camera and animation functions, but also ties it neatly into all kinds of philosophy. And which is also where I found this comparison between Miyazaki and Heidegger, of all people. That Heidegger and Miyazaki share an interesting commonality in that their approach to technology is exactly what we outlined here. The, the skeptical approach, the approach that technology has this ambivalent nature of inherent destruction in the way it shapes our thinking, and then the presence of technology makes us humans corrupt ourselves. Technology being present means we get corrupted, not by the nature of technology, but by the way we interact with it. And what Heidegger and also Miyazaki in this film call us to do is to think about our relationship to technology again. And here, here, here's how it relates. Heidegger claimed that technology, instead of being a problem, as in something that you can find a solution for, is a condition. As soon as technology exists, it is part of our condition and we cannot really remove it anymore. Because even if you just, let's take an example, if you, even if you destroy an atomic bomb, it, a new one can be built. As soon as someone has invented it, people will be able to reinvent it. We do not solve the problem by just destroying a bomb. We solve only the condition in the way in which we learn to interact with technology. And I think this is also how this relates all to this, this, this modernist utopian project in which we need to re rethink. Even if in this case the weapon was destroyed, we still are not allowed to have it. The problem is not yet solved. Utopia still flies away. We still need to solve and deal with our condition that is influenced by technology, influences our way of thinking. And he does it, Miyazaki does this, by subverting what we also already talked about, the boy's adventure story. Uh, in this book, uh, uh, Lama outlines how the boy's adventure story traditionally has a very technological approach. It, had, it, ha it has a boy in it who some way f in some way finds the way to solve a technological problem. The technological problem is solved and the marriage can commence. Um, this film doesn't really do this. This film instead... Um, as we already talked about, frames the uh, dealing with Laputa not as a technological problem, but as a condition, in that we need to let go of it despite having destroyed the weapon. So what, what all of this does is it's, it's saying this is much more complex than a simple we can solve this issue, we can, we, we can just go and solve an issue that, that is at hand. This is subverting the boy's adventure story in so many ways, but also this, to really highlight the fact this is a story about our need to grow more and more, grow past this. This is not a simplistic, direct answer to any sort of issue at hand. This is a, a call, an inspiration for us to be like Pazu and Cheetah, who are able to le let go, who are able to recognize their need to, to alter themselves, who are able to let the utopian ambition fly for the moment, to maybe return at some point. Here is an assumption that people can change their way of thinking. That we can change our relationship to technology as depicted in all these interesting ways in which they can interact with flying technology, for example, when we look at the pirates and the ornithopters. And really, that is what we should be doing now. There, there is very much a, a sort of, I guess, 
I, I wish I had my notes here, but there's sort of a politics of, of vertical movement going on in Lapita Castle in the Sky, uh, even more so than in, in most Miyazaki works, which do include that sort of vertical movement through flying machines, um, as opposed to, as, as Thomas Lamar points out, movement into death. Um, but like, I, I, damn, I wish I had my notes. Um, but like very much, I think, I think the final scene of, of Lapita finally being stripped of this weapon, stripped of this human control and, and ascending upwards into the sky where it can exist as nothing more than a symbol outside of human reach and control is I think fundamental to what's going on with Lapita. Um, not only does the vertical ascension represent it moving outside of human control, but more, more importantly, it, it ascends to exist as simply a symbol of technological harmony with nature um, as the um, ecotopia that can exist rather than one that is subject to uh, human control, human possession. Um, in terms of a, a weapon of war or such. I think something that's interesting to note uh, with the context surrounding Laputa is that the year that Laputa was released uh, is the year in history where the highest number of nuclear warheads existed around the globe at any time. It was literally at the peak of, of, of that curve of the amount of uh, nuclear warheads that existed because after before... 1986 it was increasing and uh, ever since 1986 it has decreased so this was the the height of uh questions about this kind of technology and what we should be looking to do with it uh and so i think miyazaki was definitely attempting to tap into that cultural zeitgeist uh with these questions that were surrounding nuclear warheads and what to do with them and uh, a, a little interesting connector between Castle in the Sky and also Nausicaa because Miyazaki directly said um, that Castle in the Sky is sort of connected to Nausicaa and starting point he talks about it. We have in both a scenario where weapons of mass destruction seem to be out of control in, in the very nature of what they are. And in based on these weapons of mass destruction we see these weapons dictating a certain societal order. We have in Nausicaa the, the god warriors as an instrument of destruction of control of imperialism. We have here the imperialist military ambitions to take hold of the castle in the sky of Laputa to create control. And in sharp contrast to these inherently dangerous uh, technological things, we have pastoral visions. We have the mining uh, village of the people like mining for coal and doing their own working class business. And we have the city in uh, the, the town, the Valley of the Wind in Nausicaa with the windmills and stuff. But what is interesting here is that it's not a simplistic, binary, look, peaceful, pastoral, beautiful world with nature, with this technology. But instead, Miyazaki uses this, this hot pot of anachronistic technology, of weird steampunk technology, of the wind, of, of sciences, of Nausicaa investigating, of Pazu building... And, and researching on his own flying machines of all these kinds of um, socio-historical and techno-cultural references that come together where the uncertainty is created that this is not simply a pastoral this instead is a very mixed, a very uncertain, a very unstable time and technological frame one which is in a certain way a, a subversion of a simple pastoral figure, right? We have this utopian, uh, not utopian, we have this traditional uh, nature community, but it is still completely permeated by technology in a way that really avoids this binary antagonism between uh, the natural pastoral community and technology. And I like really that Miyazaki in this film really pays attention in every little step. He always has this theme, like the same way in which he can say that Shita is traditionally female, but also is strong and independent and can go past her own femininity. Then we have these pastoral villages who are traditional, who have more of a connection, more of a community, but still are not stuck in like a primitive, primitivist, only naturalist thinking and also have openness for technology. We have this utopian modernist project which is floating in the sky, which is extremely dangerous, 
but it is still something that can be freed from its negative baggage. We can still find the kernel of goodness in it. And Miyazaki is really taking care on every layer here to do it. And I like it. I like it quite a bit. Also, to bring it in the broader structure, the boy's adventure story. He is taking it from its simplistic way in which we said it structures it, it frames the boy's uh, 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 growth as uh, through the marriage plot with a damsel or uh, to the simple, simplistic solving of one problem where the audience can just clap and sit back and say, hey, the hero saved the day. No, it's not that easy. Miyazaki takes the fun, the inspirational nature of the boy's adventure story and he recovers it from all the issues that it had previously. And this is really really great in his style. Let's uh, <laughs> transition into the loose ends bit. Is Castle in the Sky the best mecha anime of the 1980s or at least 1986? This is a question I asked myself completely randomly after watching this movie like two weeks ago. Which is also why my memory is more hazy because it's been a while. And then I looked at the 1986 anime that comes to mecha and there's really not a lot of stuff. Like the most prominent shows that came out are Mobile Suit Gundam ZZ and MD Geist. Naputa is clearly the most prominent mecha anime from 1986. And does it have the best mecha? I looked at it because the designs. I mean, uh, Naputa only has one robot design. But it's distinctive, it's simple, you directly get what it wants to communicate, and it's powerful, which is obviously important because mecha are just dig measuring contests. And if you look at it like that, yes, Laputa is the best mecha anime from 1986. Does non-piloted robots count as mecha? I don't care because Transformers counts as mecha. <laughs> also, <laughs> Diebuster Die counts well, and Nono is clearly not piloted. Yeah, I would though. Very much true. Of course you would. Who wouldn't? <laughs> Who wouldn't want again, to uh, go on to... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, ro the robot's design is actually ripped off of an episode of Lupin the Third, Wait. where they like in pa in Lupin the Third Part Two, in the very last episode, they actually feature the design of the robot. Yes, and Miyazaki directed that episode. That's why they copied it because Miyazaki had the idea. That's the that's the reason right. behind it, and it was even referenced in Urusei himself. Yes, he's <laughs> evil. He's almost as bad as John Fogerty. What a, what a guy. What a fucking guy. Uh, I took some screenshots of that along with... Oh, fuck, Nausicaa's also in the episode. Yeah, that... yeah along with Nausicaa, <laughs> who appears in the same wow. episode. That looks amazing. I that was cool. It looks absolutely amazing. I can't wait for that episode. Like, they even have that dropping thing, like the, the robots dropping. Nice. You can see the, the design of... They used to have two heads. Oh, well, at least some of them had two heads. Others also had one head, but... Yeah. It's really cool. If you account for if you account for these, these are some of the coolest robots in anime. Also, um, I will take these pictures and link them in the description at least. Or at least edit them in because you can. Ah, <laughs> you lazy cunt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I do the most important segment of the podcast by far? Oh uh, wait. Okay, it's time to shit on Makoto <laughs> Shinkai excited. again. Yay! Because if you look at, once again, my favorite movie of all time, which is Children Who Chase Lost Voices. <laughs> which has robots which are basically rip-offs of the Laputa robots. It's very close, it doesn't weird. make any sense, it's just there because he could copy it. And also all the ruins in the, his version of the fantasy world, all just a copy. So obvious where Shinkai just copies Miyazaki because he can without any rhyme or reason. That's why Shinkai should be stopped from making movies. Maybe not kill him because, Neat. as I've realized in a lot of therapy sessions since the last podcast, it is not a reasonable way to handle a bad director. So we will not kill him this time, okay? <laughs> okay, That's, that sounds great. I'm glad that you get better in the meantime. I hope at least. Oh, I can always fall back. And Don't worry. I think we can all agree on the project of stopping Makoto Shinkai. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind Makoto Shinkai. Can I say that much? I, I think fired. I yes, am you're fired. very much <laughs> he ripped off every good <laughs> anime. He ripped off Gunbust, he ripped off Castle in the Sky, in he ripped how, off like, Nausicaa. What childish do you want? and pretentious and terrible. stupid it is. 
But hey, it's got a Kashiwa Daisuke soundtrack. Ooh, fair point. Well, it's just a bad soundtrack in comparison to the soundtrack, which is also a thing that went completely unmentioned. This might be Joe Hisaishi's uh, best work of all time. This might be one of the best. All right, look, one how, of the best soundtracks. How are you gonna do that to my boy, my boy Kashiwa Daisuke? Yes. How are you gonna pull out Joe Hisaishi? I will. Him? He's not even my favorite <laughs> anime composer. He's not my favorite anime composer, but it's so much better. Just li listen to Kimi no Sete. I can't the main disagree. Theme. I mean, Joe Hisaishi is a fucking god, dude. I mean, the main theme of this movie is just amazing. That's his best work, in my opinion. Yeah. There's so much emotion it's, in it. I think I might agree. It, it's I don't really think intense. I can disagree with that. It's really one of his best. It's also one of the things that often goes unsaid about this movie. Everybody accepts that it has a great soundtrack because it's Joe Hisaishi, but nobody mentions just how good this is and how, how remarkable it is, especially from the f previous one, which wasn't as classical. This one has a lot more of that sound, that classic Hisaishi sound, as it would become to be known. And just the main theme, it's like very specific, very yearning tone, in my opinion. And it totally reflects on the movie. And in the ending, it's just so much stronger, where you hear that song while the castle floats away on the power of an angel from Ava. Even outside of those like quieter, more reflective moments that I think Joe Hisaishi excels at um there's just like even even the action music in this show is incredible i mean also i mean the opening is more important than just the song that's played in there it's very stunning animation in the opening credits that i've seen almost nowhere else the closest thing is once again the ova dragon's heaven which looks quite a bit different and the next thing would be a yoji kuri short film and we don't go there don't go to Yoji Kuri. <laughs> you know, you got me to watch a lot of those, <laughs> those shorts. You do know that, right, Dark? I'm aware. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. Oh, I, I think I very much did. I wanted to die. So, so here you go. Joji Kuro. Check him out. He Yo 10 out of 10. Yoji Don't Kuri. even watch Laputa. La yeah, Joji Kuri. Of course. Just watch Joji Kuri fucking short animations. You'll feel great. <laughs> Very cool. This podcast is not responsible for any suicides caused by this recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I guess I should talk about why I gave Laputa a 7 then. Oh yeah, you're, you're an infidel. You're the only one here. Oh, well, we, we have quite a, quite a good mix, I would say. I mean, yeah, eights, yeah. If you nines, think quite a tens, good but, mix yeah. is, is a range from 7 to 10. Yes, that is a good range for Laputa. I mean, I think in terms of Miyazaki, it's, you, you're probably not going to get much wider. I think the, the animation quality of all his movies speaks for, himself, speaks for themselves. Um... I mean, there's always Halt's Moving Castle. You're gonna get worse. Even that movie frequently gets high ratings and very few people rate it lowly, even with all the problems it has, because it has that Miyazaki factor. That's the thing with him. There's only one work from Miyazaki where that doesn't really apply, and that's Future Pay Conan for me, because Miyazaki needs the budget. In that show, he just doesn't have the time even though they went over time and over budget with that show, they needed two weeks instead of one week for an episode for that show. It still doesn't look nearly as good as Laputa or even Nausicaa or any other movie he did. But it just comes apart because everything or a lot of the stuff looks garish in that show. And you really see this guy needs every piece of animation he can get. He needs to correct every piece of animation, he needs to do everything. This man is not fit for TV animation, he needs a studio. I mean, and he stopped doing TV animation afterwards. Yeah, his last episode was in 1980, yeah. so yes. I mean, I think, I think if you look at the person who I think is, is the pinnacle of, of TV animation, Osama Dezaki, it becomes really, really obvious to see where I sort of split from this love of Miyazaki. Um, I think 
the the best of Miyazaki's works are the ones where he involves these very uh, these more complex sort of nuanced characters, as in uh, Princess Mononoke, um, and I also think that that um, thematically Laputa doesn't quite have the thematic nuance of something like uh, Nausicaa, but I mean I think. I think it's just like a matter of how in depth and how detailed the characters are for me, uh, how much they resonate with me um, in the exploration of those characters that really matters to me when it comes to evaluating a, a movie or a show. Obviously, I think there's some points where Nausicaa drags a little bit too long, uh, particularly... Um, so it kind of follows that um, that four act manga structure of um, what's it called? Y Yoshi Tenketsu. Isho... Isho Tenketsu. Yeah, that thing, the Yonkoma structure. Can you explain that for the uninitiated? Yeah, so pretty much, um, Kisho Tenketsu um, is a structure that basically introduces things in four parts. Uh, the first part, key, introduces the uh, character and important details of the setting. Uh, Shoal, uh, it just follows this towards a twist. Major changes are not occurring, but we're, we're setting up the actual twist of the story. And we see this sort of in the um, section that takes place at the military base, where the robot arrives... But uh, we see that the, the bulk of its power is sort of um, devoted towards protecting Sheeta. Um, even if we don't understand why or how that is yet. Um, and then 10 is, of course, the introduction of a big twist. Uh, a big twist. It's, you know, the climax. Um, and then we come to a more traditional Western section called the denouement. Uh, where things are obviously wrapped up, we establish a new status quo, and things sort of progress towards the end. Um, and I just think that during the... I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like the first and second acts of Lapita can be decreased by about 15 minutes each. Uh, I feel like, though there's very interesting and worthwhile things brought up, they don't really add to the overarching holistic narrative. And I don't think Laputa really has a reason to have a narrative that, that splits off so much that divides into diverse, uh, separate thematic, uh, considerations. And I think that they just don't contribute towards an overall understanding of the thing. I think that they feel, uh, some of them feel rather disconnected or, um, redundant in terms of the overall whole. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is reasonable, especially considering that uh, Miyazaki has this very evolving structure of how he creates films. We've talked about this before, but he, he storyboards and he just does scene by scene and just lets it evolve where, it's, where he feels it should go. And I guess, yeah, sometimes then then we have a train chase and then we run into the caverns and there's this old dude and all this stuff. It, it just flows from one thing to another and it could feel like it's a bit erratic, a bit unplanned, a, a bit drawn out even, maybe not hyper-focused, which is because it is. <laughs> I guess it's very inherent to his style. He just... For him, pictures become alive through their motion and not necessarily through the script that ties them together. And that's a very uh, unique way of approaching it. Yeah, it's certainly worthwhile in its own right. It's certainly a sort of dividing line between him and, and other creators, um, especially in the sort of force and control he exerts over the script in this respect. Um, it makes it, I mean, I wouldn't say that his works are ever boring or unoriginal or anything like that, but... They just don't, I think, in terms of an overall uh, narrative story understanding, they just don't flow quite so well. Um, even if the images themselves flow smoothly into one another. You know, I, I've entertained the idea that 
Now Pucha doesn't have the best pacing of all time. And I see where you're coming from, I see where a lot of people are coming from. That I could be stuff cut. But to be honest, I don't care. You're all wrong. This movie is perfectly paced. This is my favorite Miyazaki film. I can, I can completely ignore that because everything else is so great in this movie. I think this perspective is really interesting to me because like, I come from a position of I really care about tight pacing and script, script structure because that's just something that I'm really passionate about and really interested in. But for some reason, Miyazaki and a lot of the other Ghiblis just completely bypass that area of my brain and just just let me sink into this world and I'm no longer caring about okay so when is the next point that they're getting to when when are we going to get to the next place uh why is why was this needed to be shown I'm just I'm just sat there and just living in this world that's been created before me and I think it's really amazing what Miyazaki was able to achieve within most if not all of his films to create this world that you can just sink into and inhabit uh that, that kind of just drives away all thoughts for me at least that maybe uh it, i just it just exists here rather than think about maybe this should be cut maybe this scene wasn't too long i'm just absorbing all of it as as it goes yeah, i along. totally have that with a lot of miyazaki films i also have it with Especially with both the heart, where I just sink into the movie and become one with it. I will talk a lot about that movie once we get there, because it is my favorite movie. I mean, just as a, a sort of loose point that I'm interested in going forward through the Nausicaa, uh, through the, the Miyazaki movies as we go forward, is sort of um, this connection between his female leads and purity that I I think sort of... I don't have a problem with in terms of children's narratives, but it's just something that that bugs me on the side. Um, I think a lot of the time his female leads aren't are sort of unattainable as as role models, as sort of heroines, and and while the the sort of feminist uh critique of his movies or feminist analysis of his movies uh shows that that a lot of people don't really consider this and maybe maybe it's just um in aesthetic taste that i don't quite gel with um i i, I understand what you mean miki i i, I think there is definitely an element of that because i know that you tend to prefer characters that are really flawed and complex and that's kind of your the characters that you're drawn to and i, I feel similarly about a lot of things but i think uh and and to, to mention the show that i am infamously known for uh the, the 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 planet with uh uh kind of addresses uh unrelated but this the, it talks uh shows sh there are shows which talk about this this ideal uh of like things that you can aspire to uh, rather than things that you could be because rather than something that is realistic um so this they then they're not supposed to be attainable they're supposed to be inspiring aspirational figures that little boys and girls look up to but there could be it, it, it it's hard because there could be some negative aspects of that where if they feel like because it's unobtainable, they don't feel adequate. But uh, Miyazaki often takes very good care to to emphasize that these characters they're not perfect, but they are trying, and they're trying to 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 uh, do their very best in all their situations, and that's all that's asked of them in uh, a lot in his 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 films is that they're just trying to be their best. Yeah, and and I also think we need to. Uh take care here while the the uh, narrative of let's say female purity is something that feminist media analysis is really critical of in this case in miyazaki i would say that it's isn't it all kids uh, i mean it's miyazaki's position that uh, as i talked about earlier children uh become dynamic responsible protagonists who take action who who take conscience and moral considerations and 
transform them into actions. And their childhood is a space. Sorry, the childhood is a space of innocence and freedom and connection. And this purity, this these elements of purity in there are just emblematic of this. When it comes to adult females, we have uh, some more complex relationships. We have, for example, Zan in 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 Princess Mononoke, who is who we cannot claim at all is is pure in any regular sense. And we uh, also have adult female. We have Dola. Dola is also weird, corrupted. He she's determined and all this kind of stuff. The the she's she's a pirate. We have uh, in in Porco Rosso we have Theo, who is who is probably in a sense close to a sort of purity, but she is probably the most. Uh, the most manly of all the Miyazaki girls. I, I do agree with you in a certain sense, but I think also uh, the text uh, in San's example, particularly in San and Nausicaa's examples, um, they're very much in the same boat where they're these female characters that are very close, um, exceptionally close to nature. And considering the text of, of Miyazaki's films, which um, I think overall... Um, connotes nature with a very positive sort of um, uh, pure sort of force. I think they're very much, I think, outliers in these systems. I think there's something that that I think still kind of contains that connotation of purity um, that still contains that within the context of their films. Uh, even if they do sort of indulge, I think in Nausicaa's case, very, very sort of simply very in an unexplored fashion or even dropped i guess um in these moments of rage it's more of used to establish this connection between them in nature which in all of miyazaki's films is portrayed as a very pure uh natural force that that is something that we shouldn't go against um I think this is kind of a loose, kind of unsubstantiated connection on my part, which is why I'm a little uh, loath to to bring it up. But I think it's something worth looking at and thinking about. Um, and then when we look at ca characters like Dola, when we look at characters who are these older uh, established female characters, they do kind of exist in this space where they're not subject to compromises or the considerations of traditional society they they exist outside of it they exist in these spaces where they're, they're these sort of um external chaotic forces um okay hey, um consider kushana at this point and 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 lady iboshi yeah those are those are the We're two that i'm very, very much, much in their systems yeah who are in their systems who are very <laughs> shaped by the systems that make them up you know but they they end up on the the um i guess in the text of his films as the wrong side of their conflicts oh yeah um but i i do think they are admirable interesting people and that's why i don't think these are are points where you should or or could condemn miyazaki um but it's just a point of of worry for me a point of contention with him i guess I, I I think it's it's worrisome, but I don't think it's worth um, it's worth throwing out the the text of his stories where he actually has these female characters who occupy these very powerful uh, positions, um, and this is something that I kind of had to think about for a while to get over, um, because I think there is a sense that he does have all these very powerful female characters, but at the same time he doesn't present them in positions with a lot of uh nuance or or a uh, character outside the the central conflicts that he's interested in exploring i guess the thought that just arise, uh, arose in my head is that male characters often also contain uh, a certain purity think of master yupa who is always uh, through the entirety of nausicaa a mediator and think of Ashitaka, who in the entire quest of the movie is to be a mediator to negotiate peace. Think of Pazu, who's on equal terms with Shita and is just growing up as, a, as an innocent kid, basically. It is rather hard for me to come up with a male Miyazaki character, except for Porco, who isn't 
uh, who is like uh, I have one impure in a sense. So Captain dies from Future by Conan. He is a very morally ambiguous character. <laughs> like he is a complete asshole, but at the end he's one of the good guys because although he only looks out for himself and for his own benefit, at the end he just realizes that his best benefit is helping Conan and all the people. Like he is the yeah. most ambiguous character that Miyazaki has written probably. I mean, I didn't come up with that idea, but it makes a lot of sense to me that he is that guy. It's interesting that he's in the earliest Miyazaki or Tier work, if you can call it that. I guess you have a good point there, Nyard. Uh I hadn't really considered that perspective. I was, I guess, too focused on this sort of connection that I saw to, to look outside and look at, at purity outside of those contexts. And I think I think even Porco is in his own way very uh, purely focused on this joy of flight that that Miyazaki so fixates on. Um, he has his own very concrete, uh, secure code of ethics that that very much guide him throughout that film. Um, so I guess I guess it's more of a, a sort of preclusion of being a Miyazaki protagonist or even. Um, deuteragonist um that, that puts you in this sort of spot in this sort of fascination with purity um and yeah. i guess i guess in that context i can you can sort of better understanding it as these characters existing as a sort of um ideal to aspire to uh, rather than anything else family themes because fuck structure like while pasta lives in a town where everyone kind of knows each other and defend each other uh we're then thrown, like we've we then get thrown a contrast, which is Shida's family, uh, one with a cruel cousin who doesn't really care about her, but uh, what she has, like she values, he values her blood and what she inherited, the the stone, and while the pirates are quickly seen as the bad guys, uh, as you mentioned, like due to their moral code, uh, we quickly, like they quickly lean more to the side of the people in Pasha's village as they have similar fam family values and, and are able to come together, not so much narratively, but thematically, uh, because of these values. Uh, this is shown, for instance, in the very lighthearted and cartoonish fight uh, the pirates ha had with the villagers. Uh, and you can tell right away that this is a silly fight with big muscles. And this, this is interesting uh, also because the pirates become a sort of replacement family even to the point where at the end of the movie they meet they meet back up again right they escape together yeah i mean they call themselves a family they are a yeah. family mm. that's I mean, why they call it family mama. for the kids as well yeah 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 part and of the crew like, now of course they're a family yeah through this family you can see like that they're able to like, because family is strength in this movie, you can see that they are able to get uh, further because of this, like, teaming up with another family that has the same, like, family value system, kind of. Uh, while Muska, in the end, fails because he has nobody. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's a, that's a good point. That's also great into tying into all these uh, grander themes we've been talking about, but this just reinforces it. We have these... We have a solidarity of transgressive communities, which is both the village, which is existing on the fringe of, of social permissibility, of, of, like, they also don't have a problem of lying to the military and are also in opposition to the military largely. But then we have the pirates who are completely outside. And Miyazaki is saying, come on, this is a great lifestyle. They are free. They have their own moral codes. They are not burdened by society they can look at things from their own perspective from a fl free flying perspective yeah these sorts of communities these sorts of bonds are a way in which we maybe can trace a future into the state where we could potentially reach this utopian ambition right and Pasu himself is able to see this because uh basically he grew up uh, he, he doesn't have a family his family is tied to the village itself but uh he connects a lot with freedom like in the early scenes you can see that he, he like when he does the trumpets uh when he does the trumpets uh there's a bunch of birds flying and like signifying that he is also free while still linked to this village let's get let's get to some more ava comparisons because those are important 
Oh, yeah. We can't compare movies enough to Ava. Because one, the robot with hiring his death laser looks like Zeruel a bit. Because Zeruel who also almost destroys the entire base of Nerf. As an obvious parallel. And Cheetah seeing the robot for the first time is basically a mirror image of Shinji seeing the Ava for the first time, shit scared. And I didn't quite realize how deep the connection with Muska and Gendo runs, because in the end, in End of Ava, Gendo tries to take the power for himself from Lilith, from uh, his wife, but he's the imposter, he's not a true heir, and it goes to his son. But this mm. is, that's quite literally the same story. And of course, I said in the beginning, uh, not in the beginning, earlier, that the castle is part by an angel from Ava. I mean, everyone saw Ramiel. that it that was just Ramiel inside the castle in the roots. Do I have anything nice. else to Ava? I don't think so. It isn't even a really good connection with Ramiel because that image of the flying octagon comes up in 2001 A Space Odyssey and Future Police Ar Arashiman, where it's actually an enemy they have to fight, but in the, that movie and uh, that TV show, it's gold. There's a few of those, actually. But I like that image, so I say that Laputa is powered by angels. Powered by angels. Literally powered Beautiful. by angels, but by the evil kind, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay. So, are we ready for closing oh, uh, remarks? One more thing, actually. One uh, more thing. Yeah, one more thing. Did I think of uh, another thing? Like, just some weirdly... O Oedipus kind of stuff where like the pirate sons as soon as they hear that like Dollar mentioned that oh uh, t this this girl is gonna grow up to be like me they so sort of weirdly get fascinated with her and like start really like uh, catering to her Sheeta yeah I, I actually read about this this is very interesting the the way in which Miyazaki depicts orphan children versus non-orphan children in a sense the way in which the children who have to be take agency of themselves, like Shita and Pazu, immediately have like responsibility and can figure their stuff out and, and can take action. Mm -hmm. While the the kids of but of Dola basically, these adult as men, are all so tied up in her in their mother figure that they just immediately make the connection that any women will be like their mother. <laughs> right. Like this complete Lack of independence faced with these ver this very dominant matriarchal figure. So this is this is also a little Miyazaki take, I think, on on raising kids, on the way they can be responsible, and <laughs> the way a mother figure can function. Because as it is reported, uh, it turns out that Miyazaki had quite a, a close relationship to his mother, not implying anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he fucked his mother. Is this the story? Miyazaki fucked his mother exclusive no. info from the oh, no. Nausicaa cast. <laughs> well, we had, are we at Freud now? Are there any Freudian implications we haven't talked about in this movie? Who wants to fuck their mother in this movie apart from Miyazaki and the, and the pirates? Do we have anyone? I mean, there, <laughs> there aren't that many mothers. Well, there's the one, the wife of the Mind chief. Oh. Yeah. Okay, okay. I want to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun. Thank you, man. Thank you. Okay. I think we've gone so deep. We, we've brought up the, the, the non sequitur Freudian stuff. I think it's a good time to conclude. I, I think so. Too. Okay. No disagreements. Good. Then I can, <laughs> then I can, then I can conclude. Oh, uh, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Okay. Um,. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, think uh, uh, always remember to to we need to chill it. Always remember a reminder we have a Patreon, uh, patreoncom slash Narcicast with double A. Uh, please back us so we can buy better microphones for our people. Looking at you, Doc. Um, other than that, see you next month when we're gonna be talking about Totoro. <laughs> <laughs>